Okay, I think we're ready to begin. Hi. <laughs> I'm Leah Garchik of the San Francisco Chronicle, and we're going to get the, um, the thank yous out of the way first because they're really important. Um, so we thank the Los Angeles Review of Books, which is Tom's place, for sponsoring this. And I have to call your attention, too, to San Francisco Chronicle, right back there. Okay. It's a balmy Sunday afternoon, and I'm really happy to be at this event, but I've been having a great time getting ready for it. Spent the last couple of weeks with nonstop travel. I've been freezing and grumpy at the northern end of Norway. I've been trying to see the northern lights with Jeff Dyer. I've flipped back and forth between pages on islands of the Caribbean, and I finally learned the difference between Barbados and Barbuda with Tom Lutz. And I have pondered the wisdom of hiring a guide to get me through the desert to an oasis in Morocco. And on a Himalayan trail side, I've been invited to step inside a hut for a conversation, actually a Vietnam trail side, before being asked to pay for the privilege. Um, obviously, Jeff Dyer, Joshua Jelly Shapiro, and Tom Lutz didn't aim to write about place by providing strategic information about where the best place is to see the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. By focusing on specific places as seen through their own lenses, they each share a glimpse of the world they've seen, each with a personal style, an individual set of quirks and fondnesses. In preparation for today, I'd ask the three if there was a specific way they'd like to be introduced. So for two out of three, here are their this saved me a lot of work, actually. Um, here's Tom Lutz has just seen a Coke bar match, a kind of cross between wrestling and soccer that's played by 10 men galloping on horseback with a dead goat for a ball on a field outside Shimken, Kazakhstan. And so can die happily. We hope not here on this program. Um, in the meantime, he's the editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books and author of And the Monkey Learned Nothing and Drinking Mare's Milk on the Roof of the World, among other books. Joshua Jelly Shapiro loves islands and maps, and maps of islands best of all. He also brought hot sauce. That was his introduction. Sure, Although many small <laughs> details of the books I've read probably escaped me, I was glad to have actually remembered a reference for this. In his Island People, the Caribbean and the World, Jelly Shapiro wrote about a stay in Cuba. The food, bland at the time, was made palatable by the addition of hot sauce he'd brought with him. Jelly Shapiro and Rebecca Solnit co-wrote Nonstop Metropolis, a New York City atlas. Jeff Dyer didn't submit an introduction, perhaps because, as he wrote in otherwise known as the human condition, his pride and intent has been in the avoidance of any focus, specialization, or continuity, except that dictated by my desire to write about whatever I happen to be interested in in every, any given moment. If something occurs that moves me deeply, my instinct is to articulate and analyze it in an essay. He's written about photography, art, jazz, film, and certainly journey. His 13 books, that's my own count, but he's so prolific I may have missed a newborn include four novels. He's writer in residence at the University of Southern California and lives in Los Angeles. So, Jeff, I have to start out with aggressive. You say you never read magazines or newspapers. And no, Tom no. edits oh, sorry. a journal, which is a literary magazine. So is there a pecking order for literature, a value to books that transcends periodicals? You do read ours, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's really not the case that I don't read uh, newspapers. That would be, that would just be a very strange way to live. Uh, the exact uh, thing I said is I tend not to be uh, reading the cultural supplements of, of newspapers, but I like reading, you know, reporters telling me uh, about the latest antics of, uh, of your president, for example. I feel it's, uh, one has a duty to be informed about that stuff. And how do you feel a literary journal fits in in the pecking order of literature? Uh, it's the handmaiden. It's, it's there as a, as a service to the literary community. It's there as a service to books, to readers. It's not, it's not itself literature. Although, 
Joshua wrote a, a piece for us uh, on Beyonce, a Beyonce concert in Trinidad that was a, a beautiful piece of writing. And we do do some literature ourselves, but, but by and large, book reviews are there as a, as a way to kind of keep a conversation going. And that conversation, I think, is a, like paying attention to the president, is a fundamental democratic institution and an important part of the literary scene. Okay. Um, and Jeff, you wrote that you don't write for an audience. Um, no. Joshua, I was going to ask you about the atlas that you wrote with Rebecca uh, Solnit, uh, the New York atlas, um, which was a groundbreaking kind of form. Um, did you and Rebecca talk about who was going to read it? Was the audience in mind? Yeah, I don't, you know, that's an interesting question. I think we, um, in so far as we thought about that, I was just lovers and partisans of New York and cities and maps and good writing, hopefully, uh, which is to say anyone who's interested in, in the city and what we had to do. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think, I think you always, you know, you think of an ideal, people talk about thinking of an ideal reader, but I think you just write the stuff you'd like to read. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's the simplest way to think about it. Um, and I think whatever you do, that's, that's how you do it. So you three have written a lot about place. This is a question, obviously, to get you to the roots of this a little bit. But have you thought about what in your, oh, we don't have to go back to elementary school, but what gave you that bug? <laughs> you, can, you can, whatever order, whoever wants, jump in. Well, let's see, I, I think, you know, and I should say, too, before I answer that, that it's a pleasure to be here back in Berkeley. I did graduate school here, and this festival was not here when I finished a few years ago. Neither was BAM, the new spectacular BAM PFA. Mm -hmm. So it's a joy to be back here um, at this festival and sharing the stage with these. Sorry. Better? Okay, cool. With, uh, with these folks on stage, uh, I've loved the LARB since, since it was launched several years ago, and I've been reading Jeff with profit and pleasure for ever, oh, and now we uh, <laughs> <laughs> and had the pleasure of you know, having beer and talking shit with him in various places around the world, so it's, it's great to be here. Uh, but I think to that question of place, my, my thinking about place is essentially that uh, it matters in this profound way to human beings. Uh, because if you think about how we think about who we want to be, what we want to do, where we want to go, we always think about and through place. Uh, even in the sort of metaphorical way in which we speak to say, oh, I'm not in a very good place right now. I'd like to be in a better place. Uh, you know, place matters to us as a species, I think. Um, and I think there's a lot about modern life that, that tends to kind of uh, Militator try to reduce the importance of place and say, okay, wherever you are, there's a Starbucks, there's internet. It suggests to us, the modern life sort of suggests to us that we can be anywhere and it's fine. But of course, there are irreducibly important things about individual places that, that are important to us as, as people, I think. Um, and so I think that to write about place is, in a certain sense, to to just think deeply about why that is. Why does place matter to us? Uh, and so I think that's, that's a big part of why I am interested in, in thinking about and writing about place. Yeah, I run through, uh, in these books, I run through a number of theories about why, I'm, why I have this bottomless pit of wanderlust um, driving me day by day through my life. And I think in part, it's, I'm, a, I'm a bit of an encyclopediac. I, I, when I, I wrote a book about tears, about weeping, and, 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 and one of the things that several different reviewers said was, it's not just exhaustive, it, it's exhausting. Uh, <laughs> it's just like everything you want to know about tears, and then there was a bunch more stuff about tears, and then a, some little addenda, addenda about tears. And, uh, and I think that I, I approach travel in the same way. I just cannot get enough of the variety of the world, and, and especially places that don't have Starbucks. Um, which there are very, very, very many of still. Yeah, I guess uh, I think it's Jan Morris, who's, uh, of course, well known as a travel writer. But I remember her objecting to that, uh, to that title, saying, no, she wasn't interested in travel as such. What she was interested in was places. 
And I think that's something that I share because so often, I mean, increasingly, uh, getting between places is just often it, it's just a, it's just a nuisance, which you put up with in order to to uh, you know to get to the to the place you want to be. And I was always struck as well by something that other, in my view, highly overrated travel writer Bruce Chatwin said. He said he was obsessed with the origins of you know human nomadism, this idea of rootlessness. And it seemed like such a silly idea because actually human rootedness, the desire to be in one place, is actually what motivates people to move on from the place where they're at, the idea of putting down roots somewhere else. So I think in a weird way, um, travel is mo there's a sort of aspect of travel which is motivated by the idea to stay put somewhere. Um, I feel particularly strongly about that because in a way that seems almost inconceivable to young members of the audience now, I actually didn't get on a plane till I was 22. So I grew up with, you know, in a very, very rooted way. My parents, who are both dead now, they died without ever having flown on a plane, which is really, really quite unusual, I think. And so for me... It really wasn't in my blood to travel at all. It just wasn't in my DNA. And when I did travel, I didn't like it. And I found the only way that I could enjoy it was to go away for quite long periods of time where, to a new place. And then I'd have all the excitement of being in a new place. And we know what that means. It means that you find even being in a traffic jam quite interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I'd have all the little things of a routine that we depend on uh, in, in, in a place, minus the inconvenience of moving on all the time. From there, uh, Tom makes just the other kind of travel. Yeah. He makes the point that he, he admits that he has a counter uh, for how many countries he's visited, and that sometimes mm -hmm. he's even gone out of the way to just enter a place to stick a toe it off. in, yeah, <laughs> just one foot. <laughs> No, it, and I do, I, like I read The Lonely Planet or The Rough Guides and they say, you know, take three weeks to see northern <laughs> Venezuela. I'm thinking, no, no, uh, a day or two, you know, just keep driving. Uh, I am a, 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 a real American in that sense. I remember an Art Buckwald column about how to do the Louvre in five minutes. Um, and I, I just, I zoom through. And my, my sense is that if I spend a week in a place or I spend it a day in the place, 10 years later, it's almost the same. Uh -huh. That is, I, the, the images, the sense of the place, the sense of how much I know about the place, which is very little in either case, seems to be very much the same. So I move very fast on purpose. But Joshua is, is the long distance runner. He's, he's, in his book, In the Caribbean, he lives in places for months at a time before writing about it. So what do you think about that? Do you know, do you, would you say you'd knew a place after a short... You don't claim to know it. You claim no, to have I know nothing. seen it. You give us a snapshot. Right. So I'm not saying you're <laughs> presumptuous. No, sure. I think, you know, if you've been in a place a half hour, you can write about it if you have something interesting to say about mm -hmm. it. Fair enough. Um, I think that my, my work in the Caribbean and the ways in which I've tried to write about these islands I've traveled through, um, it's been an interesting enterprise in part because, you know, the Caribbean is a part of the world that was colonized, of course, long history of slavery. There is this history of something called travel writing, which was a very kind of imperial enterprise, which was these sort of European fellows going off and writing about the strange ways of the islands, right? Um, and of course, so I'm conscious of that sort of legacy, but the quote that I often have in mind in those parts of the world is Toni Morrison said once that it's the job of all writers in the Americas to to create a new map of the new world that's about discovery but is not about conquest. Um, and it's a marvelous mm -hmm. idea. It's easy to say. It's harder to do in practice. Of course, I have to think about my position as someone with an American passport, as a white man, all those things. But that can't be the end of the conversation, right? It just has to be something I'm conscious of and think about. Uh, and my work in the Caribbean, I've written about plenty of places I've been just for a couple days or a few weeks, but the book is very much about making a set of claims about the Caribbean and why it matters and why this part of the world that's often thought of as marginal 
actually belongs at the center of any story we tell ourselves about the making of the modern world and modern culture. Um, and so making a big claim like that means that I have to go spend some time there to be able to back that up, right? So that means living in Havana for a year, or it means being in Jamaica for months. And uh, of course, I got, I got teased a lot when I was in grad school. They said, oh, you picked a really hard place to go do field work, huh? You go hang out on tropical islands all the time, but, uh, <laughs> which is true. I enjoy that. They, they agree with me. But I was up to something also about trying to make a, a bigger argument, too. So that's, that's why I had to do that for this project. I wanted to, um, that's, you gave me a great phrase, actually, for the question I wanted to ask Ness about uh, imperial enterprise. Because um, expressing whether you like a place or not, I love that chapter about going to see the Northern Lights and your total misery and leaving early. Uh, but is, did that, would you have done that in their early stages as a writer? Did it take some time to feel you had the right to do that? That's not well expressed, but to feel it was okay. Oh, um, you know, there's a, uh, there's a long tradition, particularly of British travel writing, of, uh, uh, of um, you know, recording your unhappiness in a place. And, um, you know, and there's even, I think, is it in White Noise where Don DeLillo says that the uh, art of getting on in New York consists in expressing dissatisfaction in interesting ways? So I think you can either do it globally or locally. But, uh, of course, we all know that um, uh, the worst kind of travel writing assignment you can have is one very closely related to the best kind of time you can have. So let's suppose you've got some gig on some unbelievably gorgeous uh, you know, resort in the Maldives, and it's great because you're getting the equivalent of uh, you know, a $20,000 free trip. And, of course, this is great for one's wife because she's enjoying the free trip. And then the absolute <laughs> horror when you realize the price, the corrosive effect on your soul of having to write this thing up about a, an experience where really nothing has happened except you've had an incredibly luxurious time for free. <laughs> However, if you embark on some terrible misadventure, you know, I can imagine that Let's going back in the day, you know, if I was, uh, you know, if 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 I was, let's say, you know, I was kidnapped by somebody, in, you know, and it would be awful, and you know, I it would be terribly, it would just be terrible, but there would be one thought in my mind, which is that the moment I get out of here, I'm going to be on the phone to my agent, and really, a, a very redemptive book is going to be uh, um, uh, the result of, of, of this. So, it's that classic thing of the, you know, of you know, not for nothing is Aspley Aspley Cherod Aspley Cherod Cherry Garrard's book called "The Worst Journey in the World." You know, it's the fact that it was so awful that makes it quite alluring from a, a writerly point of view. So, none of you yeah. arrives at a place with a blank slate. I mean, there is no such thing as a blank slate when you're a grown-up, is there? <laughs> Go on, no. Tom. Well, I, I was just wanted to say that the, that the horrible misadventure is exactly what I seek out all the time, and it's partly because it is, it, you do know that there's a story. So I spent nine hours in a police station on the edges of Baku, Azerbaijan, and the entire time I was just so happy. I, I didn't... <laughs> I didn't know when I was getting out, but I was thrilled because I knew there was a story there. I mean, there, it's, I, I'm just waiting to write it up. And the worse it got, the better. And the entire time, the police chief was watching a sitcom on an on a old cathode ray tube uh, 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 mounted on the wall, watching a sitcom about a police station. And I couldn't understand any of the words, but they were just kind of throwing people in this fake jail cell every once in a while and then pulling them back out and every canned laughter and then throwing somebody else in the jail cell. And uh, I just thought, wow, this is, this is just great. This is, this is a great day. Not $20,000 worth of great day, but just a great day. No, and I think that uh, certainly what you say about coming to a place with certain preconceptions and then uh, I think that travel is always in a sense about we, we carry our own stories and images with us, of course, wherever we go, whatever we've read, films we've seen, 
whatever the world has told us to think about that place. And I think that it's always an interesting thing to, uh, to sort of turn up in a place and think about how it jibes with those images and how it doesn't. I think we're all doing that inherently all the time. Uh, and a, you know, like a travel book that is not called that, but a book that I really love uh, by way of an example, Great Plains by Ian Frazier. Mm -hmm. uh, is this wonderful writer, old New Yorker writer. But that's very much a book about this place, the Great Plains, as a place and an idea, right? And so it's very much about, okay, what do we project onto this empty space in the country? How am I gonna test those ideas? And for him, it's about, okay, I'm gonna go and find the guys who dress up like pioneers and pretend they're settlers in Colorado, you know, mm -hmm. the sort of strange eccentrics who give you a way to write about a place. And, I think what I often try and do is that, in terms of finding the characters who illuminate you know, your idea of that place or test them, right? Because it's always exciting when you meet that person who says, no, you think that's what this is? Nothing like that at all. Mm -hmm. And they say, ooh, I'm gonna start taking notes now. This is, <laughs> this is a good person I've met. Um, yeah. I mean, I think on some, some uh, places, in terms of the blankness of the slate, some slates are less blank than than others, so I think of, you know, I wrote this book, Jeff in Venice, Death in Varanasi, the first half of which, which is set in Venice. And of course you go to Venice and you're not just seeing the, the amazing city. Venice has been so written about, you're seeing the actual physical city through this kind of palimpsest of previous accounts. And, you know, Venice has been written about so, so much. I mean, Mary McCarthy famously said, you know, everything about, that can be said about Venice has already been said, including this remark. <laughs> um, and she goes on to say, it's not like there's, you know, there's a, a real Venice and there's the tourist Venice. She says, no, t uh, it's been a destination for so long that the tourist Venice is the real Venice. So that's a place that is, um, I think, one of the things that makes writing about Venice interesting is the way that your experience is so completely formed by this kind of, you know, whopping great tradition of, 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 of writers going there and reflecting often on the writers who've been there before. On, um, on the subject, sort of, but this is an area I wanted to get to about what forms your experience. Um, Tom, I'd forgotten when we talked about whether we were going to read that there's a paragraph of yours that I was going to read. Um, Tom was writing about being in the Dominican Republic and in a place where he found himself surrounded by prostitutes and beggars. And he says that he says to himself in such a situation, this is the normal. Perhaps my own primary sin of pride is feeling that nothing human is foreign to me, that as a cosmopolitan person I don't judge, that I cannot be surprised or thrown off my game by the varieties of human experience. I should not, by rights, have been so shaken by this experience of seeing the beggars and prostitutes um, made so sorrowful, but I was. Mm -hmm. have, the th have the three of you had that conversation with yourself of, I've got to pry open my head and say this is the new normal. I think that's one of the reasons people travel, right? I mean, I think not just writers, but people in general to travel in order to, to pry off what your, the blinders that you've come with. And so even in Venice, you know, even with the palimpsest, you still are, you are seeing it in a new way if you haven't been there before. Um, and uh, and, and uh, for me, the... It's, it is always, as, as Joshua was saying, it's always the, the, the characters, you know, they become characters once we write about them, but it's the people that you run into that, that change your vision, right? It's not the place so much, it's the, it's the people. And I sometimes talk about it as the accidental intimacy of the road, and I sometimes think of it as, the, as you know, myself as a kind of candide figure, just a, a complete numbskull almost knowledgeless, not a blank slate, but an idiot, um, wandering around and bumbling into people's lives who kind of need to explain to me their life or else I don't understand it. And so, um, and, and when they are great, you know, gracious enough to do that for me, then, then yes, it peels back my own understanding of the world. Yeah, and I think it's important to say too that, you know, one of the words that is often 
hovered around this thing called travel writing. Uh, I was also going to say that the title of our panel was funny. We were joking about it last night and said, what's, what's beyond travel writing? It might be sitting still and writing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but travel writing, another way to think about travel writing, right, is that there's this old word, exotic, right, which you still see in ads for cruises and resorts and stuff. But it's a, it's a word, if you ask me, and certainly in the, the part of the world that I write about, you know, it's a, world, it's a word that really needs to be retired, right? Because what does exotic mean? It essentially means different, but it also has come freighted with all this stuff. Different from what, right? Different from the norm, different from whiteness, different from Europe. Who knows? There's all this stuff that it's freighted with, right? And so I think that to write about different places in a sympathetic way, uh, without the lens of the exotic or resorting to that word, right, is very much about thinking about quotidian life and saying, this is not, this life in this place is not strange to the people who live here, mm -hmm. of course, right? This is life. And I think that the job of sort of being uh, a writer moving through these places, the job of humanism, the job of literature, if you like, right, is essentially to credit the quotidian all over the world and say this is people's lives. And if you can write about it in a sympathetic way, um, you know, maybe you're getting somewhere. Could I, could I respond to that? Because, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, um, I got into a certain amount of trouble when this book, Jeff in Venice, Death in Varanasi, uh, came out because I was presenting this place uh, Varanasi uh, in a, um, as though it was quite an exotic place. And I sort of, I absolutely take what you're saying, Josh, but uh, Var Varanasi is not just strange and weird and exotic to me. It's also pretty weird for people, for uh, somebody, you know, who's lived in Mumbai or, 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 or Madras all their lives. I'm sort of tempted to say, God, if I mean, and yeah, and I can see that for people living in Varanasi, it is their normal life. For me, it never stopped being a, a very, very strange place in a way that I would sort of put, put this to you. I mean, what's his name? Richard Dawkins, isn't it? Who's the big, you know, the militant, hard hardcore atheist. The, the thing is, when you go to Varanasi, which has been the center of Hinduism for so long, uh, Hinduism becomes a sort of, you know, which is a to me, a very uh, strange religion with all sorts of weird, you know, I, I like the way, you know, the idea of an elephant-headed god is quite, ex who, whose chosen means of transport is a mouse, yeah, that's exotic to me. Uh, and I feel pretty unapologetic about that. But the thing is that the belief system of which Varanasi is absolutely the heart has so steeped into every molecule of every brick that actually if you had some sort of Geiger counter for measuring it, it would be going crazy in Varanasi. And even Richard Dawkins, you know, the absolute materialist, would have to concede that this place had some special, weird, um, something buzz, charge, aura, something like that. So I feel it would be weirdly distorting not to, not to acknowledge that. And I guess you should have the right of reply to my reply. <laughs> Excellent. I, I, yes, I take the point about the elephants and Varanasi and all. Uh, I think the simple reply is that the other way to frame what I'm saying is that um, we could either retire the word exotic or consider everything exotic, which is to say, you know, a place that's built on computers and building strange machines we carry around and riding around on BART might be pretty exotic too. Yeah, yeah. So, I guess it's like... Uh, I guess it's like world, you know, world music, uh, you know, uh, uh, to people from uh, uh, Nigeria, let's say, then English folk music is world music. It doesn't feel like that to me. Mars Whereas, dancing. Yeah, that, yes, <laughs> yeah, exa exactly that. Um, Tom. Yeah, I, I, would, I would, I guess I'm on Jeff's side of this. I think that the, that exotic is a word that's become a dirty word um, for, for very good reasons. Um, but there's something, it's, it's an equally imperialistic gesture to kind of suggests that we're all the same, sure, sure. right? Um, and and, and, I, and I'm, I'm fascinated by the ways in which we're not all the same. And so the, the word, I think, that of, of, uh, of our age is difference, right? So to, to kind of appreciate difference is, is worth doing and important to do, 
Um, and it's not exactly the same as exoticism, but I don't think I would be as driven to travel to all these places if I wasn't expecting it to be different. And in fact, the places where I go where it's not, I was very, I, w I really wanted to go to Transnistria. Do you know Transnistria, this breakaway province of Moldova? Um, that's, and I just wanted to go to Transnistria, and I got to Transnistria, and, and everybody, I can pass for Transnistrian. <laughs> um, I just, it's just kind of white people, and, there, and there's nothing, uh, nothing there. And so I, I was so disappointed, um, because we, it was not at all, all we exotic. We could all be Transnistrian. We, could all, we are all Transnistrian now. <laughs> but there was, you know, we all know that uh, name dropping is a, you know, it's a low form to proceed, but this panel always had the potential to become a place name dropping competition. I apologize. Which, uh, I do apologize. Tom has for initiated, you know. <laughs> which leads me to. Um, <laughs> um, in a piece I read by Tom, he was writing about Swaziland and he wrote in it that he was writing it in Buenos Aires. Yeah. I always stumble over pronouncing that. But um, so does where you are have an effect on how you write about place? If you wrote it in Swaziland, would it be different than when you wrote it in South America as remembering Swaziland or looking at your notes or? I, th I think that r writing is a form of travel. I mean, you get, you get deeply into where you're writing about. And so the, the main effect of writing about other places in other places is that I'm doubly confused when I walk <laughs> blinking out into the sunlight and try to figure out where I am um, because I thought I was in, I won't drop another name, I thought I was in Transnistria, <laughs> <laughs> but in fact I was in Swaziland. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think this is, I mean, during a, a phase of my life when I, um, when I was writing my photography book, and it's mainly about American, uh, Amer American photography, really, and it was a phase of my life when I really wished I was living in America. I wasn't. I was living in, um, in London. But, you know, I, looking back, I realized that was the sort of travel book which didn't involve uh, going far because, you know, I'd have my breakfast and then I'd go up to my study and I would travel to this other world of American photography. And it was so like traveling to another place in that, you know, uh, the famous joke by... I think it's Philip Lorca de Corsia who said of photography, it's a foreign language that everyone thinks they can speak. Mm -hmm. But I was having to learn this language of photography. And it was just, it was so, uh, it was so like a form of travel for me, uh, even though geographically it, it involved a journey of about uh, 16 steps. Did you each feel day. that way writing about jazz? Because you've done a lot about that. Uh, similarly, although that's slightly different because I felt I had to go uh, to New York to write about that book. And um, yeah, so that was, um, I mean, that was, yeah, that was very much a, about a particular place. So I felt it was important that I could walk around this place where, say, Thelonious Monk had walked. And back then, for young people in the audience, there was this new invention called a Sony Walkman. And you could, it was a really new experience, this, which now young people take for granted. But, I mean, you're, Tom, you're, there was this thing whereby you could walk around with music in your head uh, in that sort of synesthesia-like way. That meant that I was able to really very easily transcribe, as it were, the music in terms of what it, that was in my, literally in my head into the sort of stuff I was uh, seeing on the, the streets where the musicians I was writing about had lived. You know, and I was just going to mention another book of yours, Jeff, which I think, uh, not the jazz one, but your book about D.H. Lawrence, mm -hmm. which uh, I think it maybe shelved all kinds of places and shops, but I don't think travel writing is where it usually <laughs> goes, next to the Lonely Planet stuff. But for those of you who haven't read this book, it's Jeff's book about a book about trying to write a book about D.H. Lawrence, which essentially finds this man in various places, Italy, France, if I'm not mistaken, right? Writing about uh, trying to do this thing and about these places and your own disappointments and mental states and all the rest. Uh, and it's a wonderful piece of, among other things, travel writing, right? But I think what to say about that is I think a lot of writers will say this, I certainly will, that some kind of dislocation is often really helpful to getting work done. Yeah. That being home surrounded by your stuff 
sometimes makes you want to, you know, go grocery shopping or do your back taxes or whatever you're supposed to do. Uh, but whereas being in a new place or being in a hotel room, I love writing in hotels. Uh, for some reason, it's like, okay, what am I going to do? I'm here alone with my, with my odd thoughts. I better put them down. Um, but anyway, that is to say that I think dislocation, there's something to it in terms of getting work done. I was, gonna, I was wondering if there was, just back to jazz for a second, if there was some kind of analogy about uh, jazz where there's a melody and the jazz musician responds to it and riffs on it and goes around it. And you, in writing about place, I'm not going to say travel because that's, we're beyond travel, right? We're much more <laughs> profound. Um, that you respond to a place and then riff in whatever direction you want. Is that... Is that an analogy? Is this addressed to me or to everyone? Whoever. Um, well, uh, I mean, uh, I think it is quite interesting in, um, in regard to, uh, to, I mean, I'll t tell this quite famous story about Lawrence where uh, Rebecca West turned up in Florence to visit her friend Norman Douglas, I think it was. Uh, and he said, you know what, Lawrence is here. Uh, let's go and see him. And he said, I bet he's already writing an article about Florence because he's always so desperate to earn money. And they approach Lawrence's room and they can hear him banging away on the typewriter. And they say, you know, what are you writing? And he says, oh, I'm writing a book, uh, an essay on Florence. And Rebecca West says, this was absolutely ridiculous. He'd only been here a day. Uh, and he didn't know the f enough about Florence to give his views any real value. Then after she dies many years later... Uh, she, re she says something like, all Lawrence ever wrote about was the state of his own soul, and at that time, Florence was as good a symbol as any other. Now, okay, that's an interesting enough observation, but I think then uh, that achieves a really, that's a huge, I mean, she is sort of absorbing that lesson of Lawrence's when she writes her immense, great, you know, book about, uh, about Yugoslavia, Black, Black Lamb and Grey Falcon. Now, I've not really written about Yugoslavia, but just as Rebecca West was informed very much by the example of Lawrence, so uh, that thing of, that Rebecca West does so much in Black Lamb and Grey Falcon of this sort of physical giving way to the metaphysical is something which has had a big effect on me in a way irrespective of where I happen to be writing about. Yeah, and I think, you know, one thing about trying to write about place in a in a way that feels vivid or that moves on the page, trying to create literature of place, right? As we mentioned before, it is about finding characters in a sense. And of course, there's a sleight of hand involved in that because you sort of, you write this hopefully elegant essay about a city and, you know, then I ran into this person and this person and it reads like these are the only people you met, of course. But it's about curating experience, turning it into literature, turning it into a good story. Uh, but I think that, that finding people who make that place alive and then, and then can speak to what is interesting about it to you or that you feel you want to convey, right, is sort of what we're up to in terms of creating literature of place. Yeah, for me, the, the discipline is narrative. It's about, it's about finding the story. And, the, and often, sometimes the story doesn't occur to me until 10 years later, five years later, I, just, I think, oh, that's the story there. I know, that makes sense. But I, it, doesn't, it doesn't come immediately. I mean, sometimes, with, like in the police station in, in Baku, the, the story's waiting for you, but m many times it's not. And so that's a, it's a kind of discipline. Curation is one way to, to put it, but the kind of discipline that you're placing on your experience that is very different than Im improvisation and music, um, if that's the jazz reference. Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a musician, and for me, the, the only relation between the two forms is that when you're in the, in the groove, uh, as we say in both music and in life, when you're in that groove and you're, just, and, you're, and you're flying along and it's just kind of coming out of you, either musically or on the, on the keyboard, on the, on the, for me it is a keyboard in either case, um, the, the, the feeling is very similar. But I think that the kind of the, the mental activity and the, uh, and the, the, so the emotional activity is very similar, but the mental activity is very different. So in, to use the phrase you just used, in the service of narrative, because that's what all about writing is about, um, 
Are you merciless? Do you, are there people who have offered you clean sheets and warm meals and you've left them out because, because they didn't fit into the narrative? Do you write nice thank you notes? Oh, yeah. I, I, I love those. Those are, the, those are the easiest to write, I find, right? Because I'm not conflicted about them. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, especially when you go to places that have... Uh, okay, uh, you go to Uzbekistan or you go to you know, these places that have a hospitality, deep hospitality culture, people just drag you off the streets. I was in Uzbekistan for 10 days. I went to three weddings. Um, people just kind of drag. And, uh, and, and that is deeply pleasant and, and, and often very fun to write about. Yeah. And I, you know, I think it's, it's important to say, too, that when we talk about sort of finding the characters or finding the narrative that, that moves along a portrait of place, right? is that it's very often the case, I find anyway, that you know, the most prominent people are usually actually not the people you want to write about, uh, which is to say, you know, if you're in Cuba, yes, I have to write about Fidel Castro. Mm-hmm. But the way to do that is often to find people around those people, right? Uh, you know, to go off into the town where he's from and find the half-brother. You know, that's who you want to write about and talk to because with them you can have a sort of human encounter it's not overdetermined by their reputation or their sort of worldly image, right? Um, and so I think that that's, that's always the case. And I was also going to say just on, to this point of narrative and that that's what we do in terms of writing about place, right? The journeys, of course, are narratives, right? And so that I think that to return to that point about how people seem to think in terms of place, right? The places we want to go, the places we want to be, Right? We also think in terms of journeys, right? and we think in terms of stories. So I think that you know, the, the narrative of a journey is sort of, there seems to be something totally primal and hardwired in us to, to want those things and to narrate them. Yeah, and you know, they share the same route, don't they? Journal, journey, journalism, you know. Um, I'd like to get your, what about in terms of, you're saying the people you want to meet, what about that? dread figure that one always wants to get away from but sometimes is obliged to rely on the guide <laughs> the, the guide uh, you know, I have a bit in my book about, uh, about taxi drivers who are sort of similar I think that you know there's so many travel books you read or articles where you know the taxi driver is a character <laughs> for obvious reasons because you get off the airplane and there's a guy there who might like to talk and will tell you some funny things and inevitably he or she ends up in the piece that you're writing. Uh, so there's a funny, you deal with a lot of taxi drivers and I said in my book, I said guilty as charged. There might be a lot of taxi drivers in this book. Uh, but I think that we, you know, going into a place and as Tom was, was saying, you know, willfully making yourself dumb in a sense and saying, okay, I'm here, I'm here to learn, right? And you need to, to find the people who can help you do that. Uh, of course, the funny thing is when you read a magazine piece, the person who did never appears is the fixer, the guide, yeah. mm-hmm. right? They're always written out of the story. Uh, but a fun thing when you're writing a book is you can kind of include them yeah. as characters if, if they, you know, if it makes sense to. I, I found, I don't know if, the, if, if either of you have done this, but I find that you always pick a guy in the third row of the people that are clamoring around you to be it's like a guy. The, the third most expensive bottle of wine in a Yeah, right, exactly, right, yeah. The third, the, you know, somebody with kind eyes in the back, you know, not somebody with their sharpest elbows, um, uh, but somebody that's kind of waiting. But you're not infallible about picking the right one? How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I've read your books. Yes. <laughs> I think as well this thing about uh, looking for characters, I think as well something that happens is that only in the worst case scenario is the place a kind of backdrop before which something happens, the action or the romance or whatever it is. And in the best writings about places, then really in a, in a weird, in a real way, the place is not just some sort of backdrop like you get on a film set, but is an active kind of uh, protagonist and a participant, a determining uh, part of, the, uh, of, what, of, of what's going on be- between yeah. the characters. So I think of my, I sort of fit the, the story in my latest book called Forbidden City, 
and I really feel that it was the it was the the forbidden city caused everything that did happen to happen. That Which sounds like I'm making some sort of plea in mitigation. And I sort of am, really. <laughs> I, actually, I think that's the story. I'm not, I don't quite remember. That's about meeting the woman and... Uh, yes. 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 And I actually had a question about that, oh. but we're... Uh, because about, you know, allowing yourself to go, it's a story about... Um, that's filled with a kind of longing of, of the traveler and meeting someone and not quite... I mean, it's not... Uh, it's not a romance, really, but it's it's about it's. If, if that's not a romance, it, I really it is. I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I yeah, it, it's about unre It's it's very sweet and it's very personal and it's not it's certainly journey, not travel. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to. Well, you'll be happy to know we we're going to open it up for questions right now. Um, but, uh, and then I think that will give us 15 minutes for questions. I just want everybody to know what the schedule is because at 4.15 we're going to break and, um, and the authors will be signing books. Okay? Right. Yep. Back there. Yep. But, um, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What do you do when you get stuck? Your trip is a washout. Your hotel room is a washout. The place is a washout. The people are a washout. You're not in a goddamn mood to write your piece. What a, su what a superb question, <laughs> <laughs> which Josh will answer for you. <laughs> that sounded like a totally Jeff question to me, but I... <laughs> no, I... <laughs> I'll, well, I'll just say something very quickly that you, there is the moment where you say, oh, something awful and interesting is happening. This is a good story. So that's our perverse attachment to those kinds of things as, as writers. But I, I often find, you know, when you have to have a certain, uh, you know, peacefulness about taking those kinds of moments, but they often, because they often lead to good things, right? You say, oh, okay, I'm in this town between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, and there's no boat for eight hours. That sucks. Yeah. But... Mm -hmm. This is going to be an interesting experience, sitting under a tree for eight hours, and you know, what's going to happen? And then you're going to meet someone nice who's going to, you know, give you some coconut water, and it's all going to be good. So, and of course, you can also just—I um, mean, the boring is the hard part. I mean, the good story is a good story, so bad is ter is great, boring is hard, uh, and just to be unromantic about it, eventually you have to catch up with your email anyway. <laughs> so, you do that. Um, two things. Um, not so much when a thing sucks, but, uh, you know, for example, I went to Sarajevo and I was, really, uh, I was really looking forward to going. You know, I'd written a book about the First World War. It's where the First World... So I re was really ready. I went so confident that, you know, vibrationally I would get this place. And, um, you know, I got there and I had a great time. I gave the talk that I was giving and all this sort of stuff. And just nothing happens to me. I don't mean I didn't have an adventure or anything like that. Just I didn't get this. It, the, I just didn't just didn't have anything to say about the place. So that's that's one sort of draws blanks like that, and you come away empty-handed. But in terms of things sucking, I mean the worst kind of sucking really is, and it's this particularly comes to mind with Varanasi is of course getting sick. Um, and that is uh, when really, uh, you know, you just want to be back with your mum at that point. Um, and the thing about Varanasi is that it's, I think it's really, have you been to Varanasi, Josh? Uh, uh, oh, great. Well, <laughs> really, you've not been to, to, to Varanasi, Tom. How very, how very parochial. Um, but, and it really is one of the greatest places on earth, and it's really, you've got to go there, but <laughs> you're, you're guaranteed to get sick in Varanasi. It's just a question of how sick you're going to get. <laughs> I've, got, I've just got to follow that and ask, when, when a friend, when a lay friend, not a writer, but says, oh, you have to go to such and such a place, how do you respond? Do you? Do you I just agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have to go there, it's true. But do you take advice on, on those matters? 
not really, but I have to go there anyway. Yeah. I think it's often, actually, uh, you know, from the time of its invention, I think it's photographs that have tended to lure you to, lure us to places. So for me, very definitely with uh, Varanasi, I can remember it so clearly. It was the photogra three photographers, William Gedney, Raghubir Singh, and Michael Ackerman. It was their photographs of this place which made it look uh, uh, just uh, absolutely amazing. And then you get there and you realize, oh, it's actually much more amazing than the pictures make out. Um, there's a great comment by Raghubir Singh uh, about, in, I think it's in his book of photographs of uh, Varanasi. And he says, you know, there was all this agonizing in photography about color and, you know, and it wasn't until the 1970s, as you know, that color photography really got going as an artistic medium. And he says, you know, India is so colorful. If we'd have invented color, we'd have just, if we'd invented photography, we'd have started off in color without bothering with the black and white phase. <laughs> okay. Hi. I'm wondering, when you're writing narratives that are entwined with your um, personal experience, your interiority, your mental state, um, if there are certain types of experiences that you actually want to protect um, because of a particular um, mood or intensity or just how, how close they are to your own soul and what kinds of experiences those might be or if you feel that sort of everything is fair game for the kind of work you're trying to create. I could resp yeah I don't feel any uh, I, I don't feel any um, oh uh, I think it's John Updike who said that this idea of taste is a sort of social and decorum it's a social concern not a literary one mm -hmm. so I feel completely free about revealing everything but I think I was lucky because my parents aren't re weren't readers so <laughs> with some of the stuff it was a kind of great comfort knowing my mum was never going to read this, this, uh, this, uh, this stuff. Um, and um, then, yeah, I, I just really don't have any uh, an anxieties on, 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 that, on that front. And I, th I find that I very much, as much as possible, try to look out when I'm writing rather than in. I mean, there's obviously some reflection on it that's necessary to, to tell a good story and to, to be, be part of the story, but... Uh, as much as possible, I'm interested in what's outside of myself rather than inside. Um, and I think that, in, in a sense, all three of us are, are, are in that school. No, Jeff, not Jeff. Yeah, more of the solipsistic uh, <laughs> school. On the, on the basis, you know, in a quite respectable way, it's that old cliche about writing that the greatest chance of, being, of achieving some sort of universal truth is by remaining absolutely faithful to the contingencies and... Uh, uh, vagaries of one's own one's own nature and one's own experience. Yeah, and I, I think I might sort of be in the middle in the sense that I'm <laughs> I'm interested in looking out absolutely, but I'm also I think that thinking about the ways in which I want to sort of paint a picture of a place or tell a good story, there is an emotional aspect to it that's trying to capture some kind of affective response and say, on the page, you know, I was this jazzed about wandering Havana in this way at this moment in my life because of this, right? Um, and so I'm interested in sort of trying to narrate that, but it's funny you mentioned parents uh, because there was certainly a moment, I sort of knew my parents would read what I'd written at a certain point, but there are various things, of course, that I didn't tell them about as I was working on the book. So, you know, my mother, you know, you get a call, you say, you, you got held up at gunpoint in Trinidad? And they say, yeah, I don't, I don't tell you everything, Mom, right? Um, but it's got to go in the book. I can't not put that in the book, right? But when, I, when I was writing about crying, I, I'll just say this too, that, that uh, an actor said, you know, if you're, if you're crying on stage and nobody's crying in the audience, that's horrible. And if you're, if, if you're, if you're crying on stage and the audience is crying, that's good. But if, if you're not crying and you've got the audience crying, that's great. Right? And so there's a, there's a way in which kind of figuring out how to tell the story in which you, as uh, Elliot says, the objective correlative, you induce that emotion in your reader without naming it in yourself. I think that's, I mean, that's part of what I'm going for. Yeah, I have um, two questions, and one is for Jeff and one is for Josh. 
and uh, well, forgive if the um, question no <laughs> is uh, superficial <laughs> for Jeff. But um, I assume that you traveled here because you have a nice accent and you're very Natalie dressed. And I'm wondering if <laughs> when you travel worldwide, if you always present as a natty Brit or if you try a little bit more camouflage. And for Josh, my question is, it seems like the, um, these days that geography is the thing that is most dividing us, um, urban versus rural now in the United States is a cataclysm withdrawal from various places. And I just wonder kind of like whether travel writing and how maybe all of you think this is going to present as you move through the world as an Americans or we're not and with our particular perspectives. So that's it. Well, I agree. I, just, I love this, this is the kind of question and I can answer. Um, uh, it's, it, I happen to be Natalie dressed. Thank you for that uh, compliment, which just had that slight tinge of an insult to it. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I'm dressed like this because I'm actually on my way to the airport. So the only, and my bags are back at the hotel. And I couldn't really think of any other way of making sure my, my jacket didn't get wrinkled except by wearing it. So, uh, yeah. I, you didn't comment on my get up, but that's, I don't have pink polka dots, but you know. Um, I, yeah, no, this question about geography and, and sort of the importance of, uh, of the divides it presents and the, and the sort of commonalities it presents. I think that very simply what I would say about that is that I think that now more than ever, the, the, the import of the sympathetic outsider, which is to say a sort of basic task of empathy and of, and of thinking about the integrity of all places, the, the, uh, the import of, of, of difference and of quotidian experience um, is, you know, it's more important than ever. And that's the job of literature, I think, in all kinds of ways, which is to say, in a, the most basic way, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, right? And I think that there's all these things in the culture now uh, which are related to place, but are also related to technology, related to all kinds of things that are about, you know, thinking with, talking with, engaging with people who are, are like you, right? And I think that uh, I think that if a literature of place is doing its job, right, it is about respect and admiration for difference and using difference as, a, as an occasion for, for celebration and enrichment and not for degradation and fear, right? Um, so in the most basic way, that's, that's how I would respond to that. On that spiritual and up, Beat oh, kind of note. Oh, we have one more question. Okay, save it. Save that note. My, Go on. My, my question concerns the people you write about in your books and boundaries of privacy. For instance, do you change names of people you write about, and what are your other considerations of respecting their privacy? You are putting yourself out there as an author. They didn't perhaps ask for that. So, what is your, all three of you, what is your point of view regarding privacy of people you're writing about? Yeah, uh, I, I change uh, people's people's names, and you know I've written a lot of books, and I've never had any complaints from anybody uh, because I have this very basic point of honour that goes on. I always feel that it's an absolute rule for me that nobody can come out of my books looking worse than me. Um, and so, for example, this book about I wrote uh, I wrote about my time on about the air, uh, my time on the USS George H W Bush. I was there with a Magnum photographer, and I referred to him throughout only as the snapper. And he was a bit miffed about that when he saw the, uh, the proof of the book. And I said, geez, you, you know, you're, you're complaining about that. Just look at what a jerk I come across as uh, throughout the book. Uh, so that is, I think, one of the, all of the, you know, all of the satire is really... No, no satire in the book is more vicious than that which is uh, self-directed. Yeah, and I think just just very briefly on that, I, I last uh, year I was teaching a class in a journalism school, which I'd never done. And it was an interesting experience because I was teaching students who were wanting to write long-form essayistic pieces, right? But they had just come from a class that was sort of reporting 101 for newspapers. And there are cut and dried rules about precisely these things. You know, you don't change names. You everything's on the record, off the record. 
all these sort of rules. And what's very interesting is that once they started sort of trying to write these long form things, which involve spending a lot of time with people, which involve human relationships, the ethics get muddier, they just do, but it becomes also just about your personal ethics and communicating with people about, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not write you into this book, or I am, or I'm gonna change a name, or I'm not. But it just gets muddier and it gets interesting. And that's, uh, if you're trying to write literature and not newspaper pieces, it just does. And I think if it's not a little muddy, you're kind of not, not doing your job in a sense. Yeah, Christopher Isherwood said that, um, that you can write anything you want about anybody in the world. You can, you can call them murderers um, uh, as long as you say they're pretty. <laughs> they, they'll, they'll be fine with it. Uh, but I, I, agree, I agree that, the, that it, you have to change names. You have to, you have to disguise people, especially when you're talking about places with oppressive regimes where people can get actually in trouble for what you're writing about them. And, and, uh, and, and also just out of basic human kindness to, to kind of disguise anybody that, you are, that you're making look almost as bad as yourself. Okay. Um, I think we all should thank this very uh, informative and handsome panel. <laughs> thank you, Leah. Thank you, Leah. Thanks. Great job.